here as a grown up? Start with that. Okay, so. <laughs> liars, who are your pants are down. Everyone whose phone has been going off today, please turn it off. You know, let's all be honest here. And volume on your computer, come on. We're all grown ups. Turn down your volume. Um, and before we get started, Evan, come on up here. Uh, we want to show off the, the new, uh, we came up with this at uh, RubyConf New Orleans. This is the sort of secret handshake, sort of uh, Ruby nerd greedy. We'll do it in slow motion. It goes fist bump, phone call. <laughs> so, try it out with your neighbors. Act like you're at Catholic Mass and peace be within you, or whatever. Okay, so this was a lightning talk that I originally gave at Go Go Ruko up in San Francisco a few months ago. And uh, the short version is, there's all my slides. Uh, I've had the good fortune of working with some really bright people over the years and learning lots of stuff from them. Um, and one of these lessons that I've learned was from Aaron Patterson, who you might know as Tender Love, which was uh, up at GoBruco, um, which is sort of riffing on the, the previous year about how to you know, give a, a good talk. And it comes down to three things, a provocative title, uh, sexy pictures, and Ruby codes. So here's my talk in three slides. Uh, I insult everyone with the title. And there is a sexy picture of Aaron Patterson himself. Thank you for that. And there's Rubinius's uh, instancy valve method. So we're all done. We can go home, right? All right. So the real talk. I'm Shane Becker. I go by Vegan Straight Edge on the internet. That's what my face looks like. Uh, I make websites for fun and for profit. Sometimes for myself. Uh, sometimes for the man. And a quick sidebar here. Um, I live in LA, uh, like most stories, uh, was about a girl. I moved here for the prospect of this girl, who turned out to be batshit insane. Did <laughs> <laughs> I break this thing? She's here now. <laughs> Is it his own? Okay. Siblings. Siblings. Um, so the prospect of a job and a girl. And uh, the, the girl didn't work out, but that's alright. Um, and the job didn't initially work out, and a few months later it did, but um, that's in no short measure because of Kobe, so thank you for that. I'm still here, uh, largely because of that job and so on. So thank you, Kobe. I, I literally had to stalk him. I, I waited outside the elevator until his smoke break and uh, pinned him down for an interview. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, I've made some stuff for the, the open sources. Uh, I used to live in Seattle, uh, or I was part of Seattle RB that Mitch is now sometimes at. Um, down here, Evan and I have started LA RV. You've probably heard of this today. Um, it is every Tuesday from 7 to 10 at Blank Spaces, which is Mid Wilshire, Mir Miracle Mile. Um, that's the website. It's the opposite of the name, like Giles showed. Uh, who has plans on Tuesday night? Um, that, who has plans that isn't going to this, I guess. Okay, uh, so everyone, come to this. It's super simple, we just hang out, we talk, we don't talk, we code or not code, we talk or not talk for hours. So the, the real short version of my talk is, bad slides are so bad, they literally crash space shuttles, okay? So when you're up here, or when you have the opportunity to be up here, remember what it's like to be out there. You know, take the time to design for the audience. So, um, your slides suck is maybe not the most positive title, so we'll call it Making Better Slides. Um, and these aren't rules, of course, because I'm an anarchist. Um, it's just, there are so many bad slides in the world. You know, you've all seen them. Uh, let's be honest, some today. Um, <laughs> and uh, think of this as like a strongly worded letter, right? So in the, the sake of uh, brevity or efficiency, imagine that everything I say, because I want to say some, you know, hard, fast sort of declarations about design, good and bad. So imagine everything is said like this. My humble opinion, I think it would be better if, you know, really, like, sort of polite about it. You did this instead of that. But what do I know? So just imagine I'm saying it like that when I say, this is horrible. <laughs> and also I should say that all these slides and people that I'm uh, referencing, 
in this talk and um, that I might reference from today. Uh, I respect you as people. I think you do interesting stuff. I care about what you're talking about, which is why I want the slides to be better. Because bad slides make me want to not pay attention. So, um, the first question is always, am I making a visual aid for speaking, or am I really making some sort of documentation that should be a website? And if you end up with slides that have paragraphs, that's probably not a slide, right? If you have so, so many bullet points like this, that should probably not be slides at all, or if it is slides, it should maybe be multiple slides. Like this, this one slide here could maybe be five or six slides, so I'll cover that more. So, the number one thing you could do to make your slides better for this experience is to use big text. And to make up for Brian not using the F-bombs, really fucking big text, right? <laughs> um, so here's, uh, so the, the pattern I'm gonna use is red background, which by the way, good job on the brightness of the projector to lightness ratio in this room. So you can actually see colors in slides, you know, a lot of hotel conferences are just totally washed out. So the, the, the red background is a bad example, the green background is a good example. So this is uh, Brian Ford's talk from RubyConf, and this was his title slide, it's tiny. So I suggest you do it really big, you know, it's pretty simple. Um, here's uh, a slide from a talk about activity streams. So again, you know, a lot of unused space there, and from, you know, this is a pretty small room, but when you get into conferences, 300 people big, the, the back row is twice as far as far away, and this becomes kind of small, so again, just bump it up. Uh, here's some good, big, clean, simple slides. Uh, here's one of you who's. And what helps with big text is less text. So, when I see bullet points like this, I'm already reading the fourth one while you're still talking about the first one. So, I'm not thinking about what uh, you want me to be thinking about. Like this. Right, so, plus, uh, I probably won't read that because the text too, is too small and I'm bored already. All right, you've seen slides like this. This is actually, this was an awesome talk. This was at uh, an event apart up in Seattle last year. And Microsoft is actually doing pretty cool things with IE9. They actually kind of care about, you know, doing right by the web finally. But, this, you know, th this whole thing could be a talk right here. And they just cranked it all over. Uh, yeah, you know. Uh, this guy, this is a Matt Blaze. He, uh, this was his whole uh, deck. He's, you know, the, the you could read it later. But basically, the conference required a PowerPoint deck from him up front, so he made a title slide, this, and then a final slide. Again, you know, just lots of noise. Come on, that, that's like you know, four title slides is what that should be. Uh, some, some good examples of, instead of taking, instead of having a uh, list of bullet points, you can take uh, your heading, make that one slide, and style that difference, you know, either a different background color, or, you know, italicize, or a different type, whatever, and then each uh, bullet, or each item in your list, could be a separate slide. And then, again, here's a, a numbered version of the list. And that's obvious that those are different slides, right? That this is a one big slide. That, that, that would be nine slides. Um, so here, here's uh, Jeffrey Zeldin, who knows a thing or two about design. Um, so he does, you know, say, be a one, two, three, uh, When you have less text, it also provides interesting design opportunities. Uh, so you can do stuff like this. Uh, it's not, it doesn't apply just to type. You know, if you have less uh, or fewer objects or items or things on your slide, you you know, have this clarity and the simplicity that provides you interesting designiness. Um, the contrast issue is not, let's see, oh yeah, there we go. So even in a um, you know, pretty good setup like this, pardon me, um, you know, some colors don't work well together. It's even worse, you know, like I said, when the lights are brighter, it's not you know, dusk or whatever, and you don't have a bright projector. A lot of times that projector is you know, you know, another 30 feet back, it's you know, spraying its light through a lit room, it's diffused, whatever. So what I recommend to people is um, you turn your brightness all the way down on your laptop. And if you can make out your slide, you're doing all right. Um, for bonus points, if you go outside in the sun, 
and you can still see what's going on, you know, uh, you're probably all right in these conditions. So this is uh, a pretty slide, but in low light conditions, it actually kind of falls apart. Uh, was anyone at RubyConf in San Francisco a couple years ago? So this was uh, Ryan Davis and Aaron Patterson's horribly terrible bad ideas. Uh, and this one was about Fumi, right? So they put, you can't actually tell there, but the bright circle is like this, you know, puke yellow kind of color, and it says PHP inside of there. And they managed to put PHP inside of Ruby. So, um, Dave Thomas also um, had, had this problem at RubyConf this year. He was talking about gender balance and was showing some uh, high charts that were blue, uh, blue and red, but in the lighting conditions, you just really couldn't see the breakdown. So basically, each pie chart was just a solid circle. All right, so this actually looks fine in this room. A lot of rooms it doesn't. Um, I'll, I'll touch upon this more later. But using a black background is pretty dangerous in um, projector kind of settings. So a simple switch of just using a white background and black text helps the contrast a lot there. Um, this one works because while it's white on black, it's big and bold enough that you know it doesn't fall apart too much. Um, sorry, classic. And of course, black on white is always the safest bet. All right. So um, everyone knows that Ruby doesn't scale and Rails doesn't scale. So slides about Ruby and Rails uh, by transit property also don't scale. <laughs> so if you run your text all the way to the edge of the screen. Um, it'll likely get cut off depending on the projector, you know, accuracy. Um, so use what is called the title safe area. Uh, if anyone's been involved with film or animation, is this still working? Okay. Um, the let's see, like the red would be all the way at the edge of the of the monitor screen or whatever. The yellow would be what's called the action safe area. So any important action in your characters or whatever would happen in there but any type that you need people to actually feel safely read. And this was even more of an issue when we had, um, before flash screens, when we had CRTs, and it would curve on the edge, you would lose a lot of pixels over there, so avoid the edges. Um, and here's a, an exaggerated example. Aside from being small text, the stuff at the top and the bottom gets cut. So, um, like big text, um, by the way, I, I didn't know that Giles was gonna be doing um, the Biggie references, and I have one in there too. So that's spinning cheese, real down there. Um, so, uh, like big text, use big pictures. You know, the, the Boston Globe understands un, understood the value of big pictures so much that they dedicated a whole uh, photo blog to really awesome pictures, full full screen. You know, it's like 900, 960 pixels wide or so. So if you're going to use screenshots uh, of a website, like um, Mitch did this earlier with the Vagrant stuff, you know, use them full screen. Those, um, or if you want to show an image of, you know, a laptop or whatever, you know, make it big. There's some Mailchimp screenshots. And if the movement or placement of your content doesn't matter, don't move your content. You know, don't make it hard for me to pay attention. All right, so. Um, this talk was otherwise awesome. You know, every uh, bit of type was in the top left corner. So you always look there for the headings. But I think just because this photo didn't work well with the top left, because that's where their face was, uh, he moved it down to the bottom left. So, sort of boo. Um, <laughs> Ryan Davis is such an awesome dude. Um, but his talk at Gogoruko had these not awesome slides. <laughs> um, just, just stuff everywhere. You know, I imagine like a teenager's bedroom when I look at these. <laughs> and to, to sort of compound the problem, um, all of these were sort of animated in, into place, and they weren't, you know, sort of top left down. You know, like they sort of like randomly came in. So it was like TDD, rake, incremental search. You know, it's all over the place. So. Keep it sane, basically. So here's some labels or, or uh, headings are always in the same place. Um, more example, top left, easy to read. These are sort of uh, right on the edge of good in my mind because some of these are really long, like this bottom right. Sorry for the bottom example there. Um, it's such a long heading that 
in order to make all of these the same you know, size of type, he had to make them all smaller. So if he could have shortened that one and maybe the top row, he could have made the whole you know, font size bigger. And again, here's the one earlier from the, the washing machine picture. This is how the rest of the, his presentation was. So the, you know, the titles in the, the top left. All right, so all of my slides, like all of my um, section headings, have been black and white. And um, a lot of times the presentation will be that way. Like every slide will be black text, white background, or vice versa. <coughs> okay. So in order to sort of mix it up for me visually, um, you know, to keep me interested in the audience, um, use uh, different background colors, different color combinations. You can group them, you know, use sections in your talk. Say like, okay, so uh, right now we're talking about active record and all the active record slides are in green. And then now we're talking about testing, so all the testing slides are red or whatever, you know. So you can break up your, the sections of your talk into different colors so we can tell when we've moved on to something else. So this is just some, you know, one of the default um, keynote templates. Pretty boring. You've seen decks like this where every single slide is like, that gets old fast. Here's just a couple more from Jeff Zeldin. You know, where the, on the left is the sort of like section heading, and on the right was how each slide in that section works. Uh, here's Evan's, Evan Phoenix's from, uh, you know, that thing, RubyConf. Uh, when he was talking about developers, it's hard to tell there, but they are green. And then when he was talking about uh, Rubinius, they're kind of purple. <coughs> And then these are purple, I guess. Yeah, so there's like one, two, you know, right after each other. So, you know, stuff kind of stays in place. You can tell by the color that you can't see um, that, you know, they're all the, in the same section. So, who did this earlier? I want to say maybe Giles? You in here, Giles? Oh, there you go. Um, I feel like there was a table. Maybe. Whatever. Uh, so anyhow, forget I said Giles. Yeah. I'll, I'll bring him up later. Um, so humans um, are really good at sort of visual pattern recognition. You know that we can tell the difference between the silhouette of a tree or rock and the wool of mammoth or saber tooth tiger is evidence that we're good at pattern recognition. You know we're still alive. So we're, we're good at tables that are simple, right? You know, two by two or maybe three by three, right? But when we get into big tables, like, we recognize the pattern there, right? You know, like, what's going on with, like, the temperatures of planets? Um, so instead of this, what is this, seven by eight? I'll just let this simmer for a second. Um, so instead of this big table of seven by eight, you know, maybe you could have seven or eight um, charts, right? So I, I don't know, I forget which column this was, but um, yellow is clearly down to the left. Or I'm sorry, down to the right. Whatever that means in this case, you know. So it's easier to see the patterns when you're talking about um, how good at uh, file I.O. are the different languages. You know, or this so this was the um, slide at GoGoRuko that inspired this idea. And Blake spent most of his talk on this one slide. This was like the guts of his talk. And while he was still talking about Ruby and Erlang, I was down here in Perl and you know, JVM, not listening to a word he had to say. Plus, it's just like, it's hard to recognize the patterns, and it's like, also his C1 to 10 stuff was hilarious. So, you know, make yourself charts if it's, uh, you know, numerical stuff comparing things. I'm so technical. Numerical stuff comparing things. Um, here's uh, another one from Ryan and Aaron's talk about bad ideas. And, you know, they were, theirs were intentionally poorly designed. That was part of their shtick. But I've seen real slides like this that weren't ironic. So even if it doesn't have... What is it like uh, borders and on the, the columns and rows? It's still tabular data. I'm show that to me in the chart. Um, the the one case where it is sort of sane-ish to show numbers like this. I mean, this is probably too small, but sort of actual um, like statistics is when you immediately follow them by a chart illustrating. You know, it's like but 
I sort of glaze over when I look at this. I see a lot of zeros, and my brain is a little dyslexic. Is this good or bad? What direction this goes? It's up and to the right. So here's a, another good chart. You know, we have these four lines of stuff over time. Um, and while I'm talking, I want to illustrate this. The, the green one, it has a very different growth curve. So what you can do is sort of highlight it. Is that clear there? Yeah, so you sort of gray back everything else and just focus on that. Um, typically, the actual <coughs> numbers don't matter. You know, if it's like 1.2 or 1.7 doesn't matter to me, um, I want to know the pattern, right? You know, so be fuzzy about your charts when you can. You know, that sort of helps the noisiness of your, your slide. Just show me like, oh, you know, in 2006 and a half, the, the growth went sort of really up and not so much to the right. Okay, so if you know me, I, um, I like fonts, I'll just say that. Um, so whatever you use, I don't care, just use a good one. You know, make it clear and you know, clean, very bold, easy to read. Um, I like Helvetica Bold, tightly curved if possible. <laughs> My man. Uh, uh, I've got some paintings for you. Who, who was that? Okay, let's talk about some paintings. Uh, I have a t-shirt that says Hell Fucking Medica. Museo is the current hotness. You've surely seen it on websites, especially Museo Slab. Uh, the maker of the, this font provides um, a couple free weights, uh, free versions of each of them. Um, Brian used Comic Serif up at Gogoruko. Um, today he used Cooper Black, and there's also a t-shirt for that. So like that one. <laughs> uh, both of those t-shirts are from subtraction.com, which is Koi Bend, who used to run the New York Times website, or the design of the New York Times website. I'm not affiliated with those products at all. So, so don't use Tech Powers, um, or whatever this is, or this, definitely not. <laughs> I realize I haven't said fuck it. I'm so fucking sorry. Uh, so don't use Comic Serif, right? I'm sorry, Comic Sans. Do use Comic Serif. Don't use Comic Sans. Um, Emo Brian did today. That was for you. That was for me, yeah. But that, that is all Kobe Small for misspelling your name. Um, I'm not actually, uh, I'm actually not a big fan of the Serif fonts in general, but especially for slides when um, contrast and lighting are issues because all the, the thins, all the like the details of serif fonts get lost easily, and then you end up with like a curve and a you know a little foot, and it's like that can be a combination of letters. And do us all a favor and don't use the default fonts in Keynotes. It's Sands. Lucid and Grand, Lucid of Sands. Gil Sands. Gil Sands. Yeah, it's Gil Sands. Is it? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't care. You win. Um, please don't use it. We've seen it in we've seen it in almost every presentation today, right? So mix it up, please. And I want to say that overwhelmingly, the slides have been good today. I've been pretty pretty impressed. Uh, in the macro, uh, things are better than normal. Um, this guy Jesse D. We'll see. Um, he he made a um, a slide deck which is free on SlideShare somewhere um, called Steelist Presentation. It's really good. Uh, we overlap a lot in our opinions about presentation design. Um, he suggests using a family of fonts, right? So uh, this is Nutraface, and there is like a, a light, and a medium, and a bold, and a toss, you know. So you don't have to try to use Georgia and Helvetica for some contrast. You, know, you can use the, the varying weights of the same face. Uh, Museo provides a lot of weights as well. Um, some presenters even have a whole slide about their fonts. I think Tom Coates, is awesome. I think Tom Coates makes some of the best slides I've ever seen. That's an older slide of his as well. Um, Brian Ford even hand wrote all of his slides in sort of uh, honor of why uh, at Rubicon. And that's totally cool as long as you can read them, right? I think that's pretty readable, clear. Um, this room is uh, the kind of room where this one is especially important. Because if you're sitting uh, in the back of the room, or uh, behind someone with a big head, or someone who's very tall, like Evan, uh, you can't see the stuff on the bottom of the slides, right? So unless you're in a room that is, has like a theater seating, or a tiered or whatever, or there's a very tall stage with an even higher, uh, this thing, what was that called, a screen? 
Um, all, all the stuff on the bottom is lost, right? So um, don't put stuff on the bottom. Um, again, here's uh, some older Tom Code slides where you know, big screenshots, but the labels for those screenshots were all at the bottom right, you know, would get lost in this setting. Um, this is from Steal Your Presentation. I think Steal Your Presentation is a bad example to use for um, bad examples because he made it for you to look at on your computer, right? So, you know, presentations that you look at on your computer are not the same as presentations that you uh, present on the screen, right? Uh, so, while these headings are very big and bold, half of each heading is, you know, sort of below the fold, if you will. Uh, all of the heading is below the fold of this one. And the most important thing on this next slide is in the least awesome spot, right? You know, it's like uh, for the people behind the second row, uh, there's a bit of text that says important wins over everything else, including inline styles, which is like the point of this whole slide is to illustrate like which of these two rules wins. Um, I, I wanted to do more of this today and actually like take pictures of slides um, as they were happening to reference them but it just wasn't really happening. So this is uh, Evan Dorn from earlier. Um, sorry for only picking on you, I guess. But, it's uh, okay. Where are you? I don't mind. Where are you? Okay, yeah. So that talk was awesome, by the way. Um, but there were a handful of slides where like, the sort of punchline of the slide was down here, right? And I was doing a lot of this, and it sort of gets tiring after a while. Oh, no. Sorry. Don't just stuff down well. Um, here's a couple of Evans slides from RubyConf, you know, code, code samples are just the top. We'll cover code samples more in a minute. Uh, Yehuda did the same thing. Uh, title slides are important because when you, well, when you're about to talk and the room is sort of shuffling in and they're flipping the lights to get people to sit down, this is the thing that's going to be on screen. You know, you sort of set the, the mood, you know, all candlelight and some sweet, you know, yacht rock and your title slide. And then when you save your uh, slides to PDF and put up on SlideShare, this is gonna be the thumbnail. When Confreaks makes the video of the slide, this will be the thumbnail, right? So if you have, you know, your company logo, and your copyright, and your, you know, all that crap on the, you know, ads 200 by 100, it's just gobbledygook. So make this slide, you know, clear and impactful as well. My, actually, my title slide is not the best thing in the world, I'll show you some better examples here. So I would not say this is awesome. Um, this, I would turn into maybe like six or seven slides to walk through them. You know, like at, at the beginning when I said, I would have said, like, I'm Marco, I work, you know, at this place, which is here. You know, I make this thing, here's the URLs, whatever. I would walk through, you know. Um, here's a good one, you know. Uh, what am I talking about and what is the sort of uh, focus of that thing? Uh, here's Tom's. Um, what is it called? Title slide. So it's it's very like sort of has a visual hierarchy. You know, like the title is the important thing. You could also tell who's talking about it, but that's you know secondary. And he also let's say uses a few um, sort of design elements on the title slide that he references later. Um, this one's a sort of good exception to that. Like, don't put too much stuff on the front or the first slide. Because when you save this out as a thumbnail, the, the bits down below that aren't really important are sort of lost, and that's okay. But the thing in the middle is still readable at you know, 200 by 100. But from this one slide, you can tell that uh, Chris Messina talked about activity streams in, at South by Southwest in Austin on March 13th. So um, everyone's done a pretty good job about this today. Uh, you know, I think part of the speaking experience is about the speaker. You know, it's, if this was just about Vagrant, then I could just go to the Vagrant website, right? But um, I'm, um, you know, sharing this sort of moment with Mitch as he talks about it, and I'm learning things from him, and, you know, there's a little bit of performance, but also there's, like, the sort of opportunities that come from speaking, right? So when, you know, both good or bad or whatever, or, you know, sometimes it's about a job, sometimes it's, like, other, like, collaborators or just friends or whatever. So if I just saw this presentation or I downloaded it later and there was no clear way to get a hold of Mitch, I'd just be like, oh, this is a bigger thing. I don't know how to Google. I will never find this guy. 
So make sure you sign your work. I remember watching um, <laughs> the, the Bob Ross painting show um, on PBS when I was a kid, and he would he would do these awesome paintings. Imagine if that one was on like velvet, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, such a nice way. Yeah, such a nice way. It's nice. It's a, it's a nice, friendly White House. White House. Um, so at the end, he was he would you know work his way through the painting, and always like the last couple minutes, he's, he would sign his work, and he always made a thing about you've got to sign your work, and he always did it. Unfortunately, his signature is on the bottom right, so people in the back, it's down there. Um, yeah, bottom left. Well, I'm in a helicopter looking in a mirror, so it's yeah. my race. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, he would always sign his work, right? So, you paint a uh, cabin in the wilderness in wintertime, sign your work. Uh, don't do it like this, because that's just a bad slide anyhow. Um, but it's, who's doing that? <laughs> I want to be the cranky old professor. Um, so, this was a pretty good one. You know, it's like a picture of the dude. Uh, his, his real name and, you know, contact information that is relevant that we actually use, like, uh, well, no one uses Buzz, but, that's <laughs> weird, <laughs> that's weird, he, he works for Google, so he maybe had to do it, yeah. um, but, you know, his Twitter's on there, right, um, here's a great one, right, so, you're, you're, I hate saying the sort of buzzwords, but, like, this really helps this dude's personal brand, you know, so after this awesome talk, um, it's clear what his face looks like when you run into him in the bar, you can buy him a drink, right? Or, you know, a uh, juice or whatever. And his name is sort of title, and then in the corner there's some like Twitter or whatever. Um, and you can sign your work however you want, right? There's sexy uh, Aaron Patterson again. Um, or maybe just do your Twitter handle, right? So, did it, just, you're not gonna hurt my feelings either way, but did anyone start following me after I put my Twitter name on the screen? Yeah, awesome. That's the first time that that hasn't happened. Um, every other time I presented and I gave my, you know, Twitter Twitter handle, like my phone started buzzing while I was speaking. Right, so put put your Twitter name up there. You know, put your blog up there or whatever. Um, GitHub, of course, works in these kind of situations. But like, give me some way to get a hold of you and to like follow your progress. Um, so we're all the nerds, and the nerds like the codes, right? And uh, this is where I'll mention Giles. Giles had a few uh, code examples. Um, and did you do your whole, did you um, construct your whole presentation on the iPad or did you just deliver it on iPad? Uh, like 90% iPad. Some okay. of it was scanned. <coughs> yeah. So I, I've done that before and there are definitely um, things that are harder to do on the iPads, like take a screenshot and crop it or, you know, like, so there's some limitations there. Um, overwhelmingly, it's a fine experience, but uh, code samples are one of the places it sort of falls down. Um, so like everything else, um, use high contrast. This, and this room is really bumping. I mean, it's awesome. No, this room is awesome. But as far as my examples about contrast goes, this room doesn't apply. Um, so uh, actually, there were a couple that were hard to read that were I use a dark background in my terminal. I use a dark background in my text editor. Most of you do too, I'm guessing. Um, do the opposite for your presentation, which a quick uh, presenter sidebar. If you're ever in a situation that doesn't have good contrast like this, you run into a slide that you can't read, like the, uh, the red text on the black background, right? Um, and that's important to your talk, and you can't sort of like audible around it. What you can do is, in, at least in OS X, um, there's command option control 8 will invert your colors, right? So you're like, oh crap, people can't see this. You hop out of Kino, or out of presentation mode. You do shotgun 8, Ooh. and then, yeah. So now it's <laughs> inverted colors. It'll cost you a microphone. It'll cost you a microphone. Sibilance, sibilance. <laughs> I, didn't, I wasn't there, but the like the slide deck looked really great. Um, well, had lots of great information in it. Um, but I, you know, I don't. I think they presented it on a projector screen, so 
Uh, they probably had some contrast issues. Also, aside from contrast, um, it's good to use, um, say, like a big font size and uh, less code. You know, so show the least amount of code to illustrate your point. If you can't show less than this, then maybe you can uh, walk through this code in three chunks. Say, like, this is the method I'm talking about. It's 30 lines, and so I'm going to talk about this, you know, conditional up top, and then you know, walk through it in a few slides. But um, do it like this. You know, white background, bold text. Is that 10 or 5? 10. Cool. Um, you know, so some more code samples here. Make it uh, as the like everything else, make your text as big as possible without like uh, line wrapping. Uh, make it bold. Make it you know high contrast. Um, I've seen, I think I feel like I've seen this today where uh, somebody stays on one slide and just adds one piece at a time. Right? I think that's cool. It sort of like helps our focus. Like what is important to look at. Um, here's a chart where uh, what you know we're going to look at uh, Active Record two three and then three zero and it sort of jumps up. Right. So everything else stays the same. Set the lines. Um, this is a cool trick that I picked up from some other people where um, you know, you're going to go through this section, right? Or you're going to talk about a couple pieces, but they're related. So links and forms, right? So uh, that's the, the next big piece of my talk. And for now, I'm just going to talk about links. Blah, 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 blah. And now I'm going to talk about forms, right? So you give it sort of some context, uh, but you like focus on what's important. This was uh, this crazy diagram about sort of like activity model stuff. So he showed the whole thing, and then he walked through all the different states, grading back everything else, so you could focus on the thing that he was talking about. And this is the part of the song where there's a buildup. And by buildup, I mean where you start with a little bit, you add a little bit more, you, know, you keep building your thing. So rather than just like starting with, this is what activity streams look like. You can sort of give the, the lineage of it in pieces. So that's a good way to sort of like help understanding is to, you know, it's like small iterations, right? And then after the buildup is always the breakdown. So sometimes you start with a lot of stuff, right? So, eh, okay. so whatever, that, that is some atom. That is some atom with the activity streams extensions. And we just added a lot of stuff. It's the yellow and white. Um, but really what we're trying to illustrate here is that's what we added, and it really it says a person posted a note. All that was to say this, right? So you sort of, you, you put some stuff there and you sort of like either gray it out or knock it down. Um, that slide wasn't supposed to be there. That's from an old version of stuff. Um, and like I said, these aren't rules. If you want to act like the rules, that's cool, but rules are for breaking, so um, there are exceptions to all of these. Uh, long live the snowman. And for more stuff that I make, you can go there. I made a screencast version of this. If any of the speakers today want to volunteer their slides for uh, <laughs> you, uh, uh, then I will gladly take them and use them as good and bad examples in a future version of the screencast of this talk. Um, so, uh, I've talked with some of you about this before, and I think this is the right room to talk about it. I quietly launched this site. Um, the idea is sort of uh, like our friend Jeff Grosenbach uh, with the peep codes. Screencasting is sort of like that. Um, with the twist of them being five to ten minute sort of info snacks, very, either a very high level overview of something like, say, Vagrant, or a very focused, deep dive into like, how does eval work in Rubinius, right? Whatever, that was just an arbitrary example. So, if you are in this room, or you know someone who's not in this room, that would be a good uh, contributor to this, come talk to me, and we will make a little screencast together. I will sell them, you will get most of the money, I will get a little bit of money. Um, that's all. Um, so, I have like seven minutes. Kobe, does that seven or that six minutes include QA or before? No, that includes QA. Okay. Uh, are there any cues that I can make? Hardle. Yeah, what uh, resolution do you use for your slides? Um, 1024 by. 
for whatever that be. Yeah. Um, because fortunately, most projectors now are worth a damn. Okay, that's cool. Because that's what I used, but I wasn't. I was paranoid that I would come in and it just wouldn't work. Right. Uh, for screencast, though, I use eight by six. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I bought your, your to the extent that, to the extent that my slides sucked. They were partially your fault because I bought your screencast last week. <laughs> that sounds like an operator error. <laughs> I have the bulk addresses. Oh yeah, Ron Evans. Let me tell everyone about Ron Evans. He is part of LARB and LA Ruby. And today I learned that uh, he has some historical relationship with the Grateful Dead, and that explains so much. What's <laughs> your question? Well, my question is about the code, man. <laughs> well, I really, uh, I just really wanted to hear your comment. And just Yehuda did such an amazing job of illustrating the execution path for a particular method, and you didn't really get into that when you were talking about the codes section. Talk about that because that was great. And uh, Kogoruko and his lightning yeah. talk. Yeah. So um, what Ron's talking about is uh, Yehuda was showing the um, sort of built-in, caching, stale, refresh stuff in Rails 3. Um, or that's coming in 3.1, maybe? Whatever it was. Um, so he was like, this stuff is already there. You can use it now, but it's not as convenient. So he was like, this is what you have to write um, to check to see if the page needs a new version. Right? So you, you load this request, and um, uh, has anything new happened on this blog post? No, we can just serve the cache version. Um, you could already do that now. But you have to check on, you know, like, uh, you have to check on it yourself. So in 3.1, I think, they're adding, or maybe it snuck into 3.0, um, a way to basically say, if this is stale, do this, otherwise do that, right? So it's like, you know, your like uh, eight or 10 lines with sort of long conditionals turn into five lines with if stale, else. Um, so the way he did that was like, all right, so here's the one line, you know, uh, go get all your uh, your blog posts and all its comments, and that's it. Well, we want to do that every time, you know, if we don't need to. So uh, then he, like, wrote this conditional, and then we also have to check this, uh, what is it, the C-tag? C-tag? E-tag. E-tag. C-tag is the codes. Um, so you go check the E-tag, too, and this and that. And it's like, okay, so that's sort of long and verbose, and you always have to do the same thing. Um, what if there was a little convenience method? So he sort of built it up, tick, 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 and then you know tore it back down. And that's kind of what I was trying to illustrate with the, the, the build up and the breakdown. But Yehuda's example is real good. So he, he wrote this method, or built it up, and then tore it down. And it was like a, a great light. Anyone else? Right here. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, like uh, Animaniacs and like Tiny Toes. I love Roger Rabbit. Um, <laughs> um, animation can be used uh, wonderfully. Um, that guy, Tinderlove, Aaron Patterson, he used the sort of the more you know with the little like, he used that wonder wonderfully. So um, it all depends. I wouldn't say that I loved Jim's animating like the numbers on the screen. Um. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> Timely, topical. Um, there was another one in the middle. Okay, so uh, I feel like something that people are hamstrung by a lot, is, especially when you're doing something that's training oriented, they try to cram a lot of information on the slides because they know they're going to be printed. And people are going to take these home with them and they don't want to give them slides each with one word per page, especially when you've got like slides where things appear, it's really annoying when you get like six different copies of the slide with things appearing. Sure. So, I mean, have, do you have any tips for designing around knowing it's going to be printed as well as presented? Um, yes, I do have some tips. Um, the first one is to try to convince people to not print every damn thing in the world. Um, <laughs> The second is if you know for sure that you know like, something's gonna be printed, there's always the um, like the speaker notes field in Keynote. I'm guessing PowerPoint has it too. So you could say like um, testing, you know, if you just want to do like this high level thing, and then put like the big blob down below, you know, like that's what needs to read. Um, you could encourage people to print like two slides per page. That'll help. Um, you can also 
you know, the, the let's, like, let's say uh, screencasty.tv, you know, I wanted to come out like S, S C R E, you know, like one slide, you know, one letter per slide. You could actually do that as an animation, at least in Keynote, I don't know about that PowerPoint thing, but like you can do it as an animation on one slide so that when it's printed, you see the uh, last sort of version of that slide after all the animation happens. So you could, I don't know, if, if you can do the sort of changes all on one slide, it prints as one. Uh, one tip, and this is what I did this morning, create a normal version, create a version that you're gonna give away, and then, and then save that version, your content's good, and then go back through and do all your, because viewing it at, at a computer is different than, than, than me speaking or Shane speaking. Right, so right yeah, so that's the big thing, is like, is this a visual aid or is this a shareable document? They, they don't overlap very well. I would say, um, you know, do a blog post about your topic and include a link to SlideShare or embed the little bio. Anyone else? All right, I'm in, I'm in Phoenix is up next.